Hello and welcome back again, everyone. Today we're going to recap an action war movie from 2001 called As Far As My Feet Will Carry Me, and it's about a German World War II POW escaping from a Siberian gulag in the Soviet Union back to Germany. Clemens Farrell, a lieutenant, is getting ready to board a train. He's waiting to see his family first before leaving his wife Catherine wearing a blue coat. She finds him and tells him that she was at the doctor's and that she's pregnant. Clemens is happy and the two embrace. He says goodbye to his daughter too, named Lisa, promising to make postcard to her before hugging her and getting on that train. He promises the family that he'll be back for Christmas and off he goes. Now the next thing we see of Clemens Farrell is when he's being charged for war crimes, he's found guilty of crimes against partisans and sentenced to 25 years of forced labor, starting that day, 13th of July, 1945. Clemens finds himself sitting aboard a train. Not a nice one either. It's all filled with people freezing cold. He sits on the floor leaning against the carriage wall, hugging himself and shivering. A man wakes him, telling him that it's his turn, and Clemens literally pulls himself off the wall, having been stuck there by the cold and ice, and goes over to the tiny, tiny fire, trying his best to revive it. The man who commanded him then tells the others to turn over, and they do so. Now Clemens hears a man speak, repeating the words he won't let go. He looks over to this man and sees that he's stuck in place, unable to get up. And the man beside him lies with an arm over him, so Clemens kneels and takes a closer look, seeing that the other guy is dead and frozen solid, and he tells it to the guy, talking visibly upset, and they haven't even reached the camp yet. Now back at home, a man delivers a letter to his daughter Lisa. She's sitting in the garden's grass and trees are growing healthy. She takes that letter, rushes home, running across that meadow passing beautiful trees and even a nun reading the book along the way who says hello. She enters the church and finds her mother and she gives her that letter. Now Catherine's looking shaken, all worried as she looks at that letter, opening it quickly as Lisa watches silently. The priest comes up behind her asking if it's from her husband. Catherine replies that it's from the Red Cross and that there's no information about the Russian court-martial. They know nothing, she's very upset. And her baby, whom she was pregnant with at the time when she said her goodbyes, begins to cry. Catherine goes to comfort the baby, and Lisa speaks to the statue of Mary, saying a prayer. Now, back in the frozen and barren landscape, the train continues the journey. Clemens speaks to a man called Dan Horn, asking about the man's job before he ended up here. Dan Horn was a map maker, he asks him where Cape Desnev is and Dan Horn uses a spoon to draw a map in the ice against the carriage wall marking out where their current location likely is. Now they're heading northeast. Another man says that they'll never get there and that they're going to starve and freeze to death before they do. Another guy says that they deserve no better. The first man replies that they were just doing their duty. He was in the essay and he says he's proud of it. A fight begins to break out. But before things can escalate, the train comes to a stop. Now they've arrived at a station with armed men in watchtowers and soldiers on the ground with dogs. The scene all looks too sinister and very cold. These POWs are ordered out at gunpoint. The bodies of those already deceased are stripped off of their warm clothes and loaded onto a truck. Clemens joins a line where each man is given four pieces of wood. He remembers his wife's words and thinks of the baby he hasn't met yet remembering the promise he made to his family to be back by Christmas. He takes more than four pieces of wood and looks up to see a man pointing a gun at him. He's kicked over and falls in the snow. Now when they get back on the train, they're fed scraps. We see that these men are desperate scraping ice off that wall and eating it. The men are convinced that they're gonna die either from starvation or the cold, or just getting shot by the guards. And before he falls asleep, Clemens pulls out a small picture of his wife and daughter and looks at it when he wakes up. It's daytime. He looks out a tiny window watching guards beginning to gather outside to take him away. And as soon as the train doors open, the prisoners jump out, falling on the ground and eating that snow. The scene is chaos as those guards try to regain control. Eventually, the prisoners leave the station traveling in a long line through the cold several of them falling from exhaustion, freezing and dying in the snow. The wind is bitterly cold. The journey is far now along the way, as they're walking across a frozen lake. 
A man collapses. One of the guards shoots at him, startling one of the horses which panics rearing up that the ice breaks. One man dies unable to be saved as he's sinking down to the icy depths of that lake. The journey continues for miles and miles. They're now somewhere in Siberia and it's November now. Eventually they reach the barracks, they're lined up and inspected. Clemens hears a ship realizing that there must be a harbor nearby. One of the men in the line collapses and then gets shot soon after by one of the guards. Lieutenant Kamenev, who's overseeing everything, comments that only the strongest and fittest will survive the doctor beside him. Dr. Stauffer comments that his presence isn't really needed, but Kamenev disagrees, saying that he's going to be needed to write out those death certificates. Night has come, and the prisoners are still being inspected. The young man standing next to Clemens goes to whisper as one of the other prisoners are being inspected. Kamenev saw him whispering, approaches him demanding to know what he's hiding. The young man reveals a letter and Kamenev orders him to take off his clothes as well as he does this. The lieutenant tears up that letter into tiny pieces and throws it away. Now that guy's standing naked and Clemens begins to unbutton his own coat. Kamenev goes to him asking him what he's doing. Clemens replies that he's taking off his coat to give to his comrade so he doesn't freeze to death. Kamenev asked Clemens his name and Clemens answers. Kamenev tells him to keep his coat because he's going to need it. The POWs are ordered to march away as that young man continues to stand there freezing. He's never seen again. Now they all march through an archway upon which is a great sign written on it. Long live Stalin with a picture of Mr. Joseph Stalin right there and they're led into some sort of mine ordered to take off their clothes, putting them in a big pile. Shoes included, they're washed, de-loused and shaved all over. After this, they're giving back their clothes. Clemens finds his own coat with the picture of his family now faded, hidden inside. They're forced to work in these mines. It's dirty, dark, and grueling work. Meanwhile, back at home, Clemens's wife Catherine is trying to find him. But no documents of him can be found. New negotiations with the Russians will take place in autumn, and Catherine is forced to just simply wait, not knowing if her husband is dead or alive. It's now 1949. Dan Horn is killed when a part of the mine collapses on him. Clemens tries to dig him out, but it's already too late now. Clemens is brought before Kamenev ordered to get a particular machine working, saying that his file states that he's a mechanic. Clemens tells the other man in Russian already working on that machine to turn it on and off again. Kamenev asks if he can really speak Russian. But Clemens replies that he only knows a few words. The other mechanic is dismissed. Clemens is left to work on that machine alone. By the time he's finished, it's nighttime, and the machine is working. Using the noise from the machine as a cover in the night, Clemens jumps into one of the carts carrying coal, making an attempt to escape an attempt that fails as quickly as it was started. He's found by one of the guards as a punishment. He's left in a well with a grate on top preventing him to escape. It's raining heavily. The lieutenant standing above asks him if he's still alive and asks him where he was planning to go. He tells him that even if he did manage to escape, he would have just been sent right back. Kamenev tells Clemens that when he's pulled out of that, well, he'll never leave this place. Clemens is punished, further being beaten by the other prisoners once returned to the mine. He's protected by one of the others using his own body to do it. Clement survives this ordeal, though he's badly injured. Then the doctor comes to check him out and he tells them that the other prisoners are pretty hungry and they didn't have anything to eat for five days because of his escape attempt. Kamenev comes over and orders Clemens to be taken to the sick bay. Slightly nicer accommodations. Now Clemens begins to run a fever and the doctor says that he hopes it isn't typhoid. He's begging the doctor to help him telling him that he has to write to his home. The doc replies that any letter sent would never arrive. Clemens is determined to go home, and the doc says that he's going to help him shortly after Clemens is sent back to work, despite still having that fever. This was done on Kamenev's order before he leaves. The doctor whispers to him to see him that night, and so Clemens sneaks away to visit the doctor. The doc tells him that before Dan Horn died, he drew a map, but before the doctor can go into too much detail, there's a knock at the door, and Kamenev comes in. He begins to question the doctor as Clemens is hiding shortly after he leaves. And once they're alone again, the doctor says to Clemens, there's not enough time to explain this. He gives him his sweater and boots, telling him that tonight is his only chance of escape. And if he enters the mines again, he'll never come out. 
He also tells him where he hid some supplies, saying that he intended to escape himself at one point, and the reason he didn't do this is because he has cancer, and he tells Clemens to go in his stead, asking him to visit his wife and tell her of his passing. Clemens promises to do this, and that night, he escapes closing that door, and stepping out into the freezing cold, he grabs the hidden supplies and escapes Kamenev, realizing Clemens is now missing, confronts the doctor, but he's already dead, having injected himself with something. Now the other prisoners left behind are punished for Clemens' escape. They're forced to work without food. One of the prisoners speaks up, saying they'll never beat another fellow prisoner again. He's shot, killed. And that night, one of the scouts sent to look for Clemens. He comes back and reports that they haven't found him instead of going west as expected. Clemens went further north instead, planning to travel along the coast. The scout continues saying that they've been searching for five days and Clemens is likely buried under the snow. Kamenev is not happy to hear this and still believes that Clemens is still alive. Days later, having run out of food, Clemens says a prayer he reaches water and after a lot of attempts with his gun, successfully manages to kill a seal. He screams in joy and triumph, able to use that blubber to keep himself alive and back. He continues to travel for days, eventually finding his first tree. He's hugging that, overcome with joy, now believing that he's gonna make it one night, he's found by two guys offering him safety, but because of his fear, he rejects that offer, telling them to just go away. However, they find him again. Later, after a severe storm, Clemens is trapped by a fallen tree. Now accepting their help, he follows them. Clemens stays with them for some time, before being found by a nomadic Chukichi who saved him from a pack of wolves. And he stays with the Chukichi for only a short time, leaving soon after finding out that the Soviets are still looking for him. He's given a dog by the nomads and continues his long journey. It's now the summer of 1951. He's walking through the forest. The dog, now named Argish, having heard a noise, it runs over a hill and begins to bark. He goes to call him back, trying quickly to leave. But the man Argish was barking at orders him to come out holding a gun. So now Clemens is questioned by a man who's in charge of the logging operation. He ends up revealing his true name and where he's going off to which is 800 kilometers away, so he's offered to ride on the train as a brakeman, which he accepts. However, there's betrayal, and by the time he gets to his destination, Lieutenant Kamenev and his men are already waiting for him. Argish attacks Kamenev and is shot and killed. Clemens starts to run away, pursued by other men. He's jumping from a bridge and lands on top of a passing train, escaping, it's now 1952, and Clemens has reached Central Asia. He's wandering through a market looking at all the food as he's going by. He's starving. A boy gives him some bread, and Clemens, in a permanent state of fear, runs away to eat. He's offered a place to stay by a Polish Jew who finds him praying at an altar in the man's home. Clemens is offered sugar with his tea, and he grabs literally a handful of sugar and stirs that with his finger, and this man helps him acquire a passport, despite knowing Clemens is German. Clemens continues his journey now using that passport. Given to him, he buys a postcard as he made that promise to his daughter many years ago. Meanwhile, that man who saved him and gave him the passport is found by Kamenev and is being questioned. The man admits to helping Clemens, saying that he'd do it again before dying of a pre-existing heart condition as he clutched his chest back to Clemens who is unable to travel further by vehicle due to a landslide on the road. And he goes on foot after a tense moment as that passport's being checked he's allowed to cross the border into Iran. However, as he's crossing that bridge, he's met by none other than Kamenev himself. Kamenev staring him down for a long time before stepping aside so Clemens can pass, which he does reluctantly. Kamenev claims his victory, speaking calmly before walking away. Clemens now finds himself in Tehran's federal prison and is sentenced to death under suspicion of being a Soviet spy. However, his uncle, who's not seen him since 1937, is brought to identify him. Clemens immediately recognizes him, calling him uncle, but his uncle claims not to recognize him to prove his true identity. His uncle hands him a photo album, which Clemens pours over, and he gives specific details about a certain photo confirming his identity. The two tearfully embrace, and finally, at long last, walking, Clemens finally returns home. He's standing outside his home. It's snowing. He's looking through the window, seeing his family, his wife and his daughter, now many years older and the child he hasn't met yet. His family leave the house and visit a church and Clements follows his daughter, sees him first, walking down the aisle, embracing her father. Catherine, in shock, gets up from her seat slowly, approaches him, get the tissues ready and they embrace. 
and the family is finally reunited. And here the movie ends. <laughs>